So I'm going to talk, you know, this is password, uh, but really it should be AuthCon or, <coughs> I don't know, Identification Con or something. Uh, there are so many topics that are related to passwords because, honestly, we all hate passwords, although we are passionate about them and we want them to go away. So we need different ways of uh, authenticating. So this talk is going to be about ID implants, cyborgs, unique identification, and the future of authentication. So it all started in my hometown at an evening seminar. I was tipped up, off about this because I am uh, very passionate about science fiction too, and um, I've I, I like cyborgs a lot, and so I got tipped off, and they said, hey, you can go there, and you can become a cyborg. You can upgrade yourself to become a cyborg. And I'm like, yeah, I'm totally going to go there. I'm totally not going to do this, because anyone who would do this either has no sense of self-preservation or uh, no, no possibility to do risk assessment. And like, risk assessment is what I do on autopilot all the time. Uh, so I went there, and 40 minutes later, I had an immediate urge to get this implant. And so I realized that something is not healthy about this. What just happened? I obviously had an epiphany, epiphany 13 months ago. So what I really realized is that security geeks like me we do the risk assessment and we say, this, 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 and this is the problem about this. This will never work. And the entrepreneurs there who are like very, very uh, creative and like doing, doing stuff all the time, <coughs> just, just do it like that. Uh, so there's a cultural clash between the security geek and the entrepreneur. And we stand on the side saying this will never work. And the entrepreneur are saying, like, that's not nice. And so they go away. And we, we part. And we never meet again until the entrepreneur is really, really successful. And those exact things that we were pointing out are very apparent and has scaled very, very much. And so we can stand here again and say, yeah, I told you. Um, and how do we do, what can we do to counter this effect? Like, I used to be a tech skeptic. I got myself a smartphone at the very last, like, I think my parents got, um, got smartphones after me, but no one else, basically. Uh, I used to think that technology is not a part of the solution, but a part of the problem but uh, I have since changed perspective on that. Um, so let's talk about privacy and also about cyborgs. At the time I was going to this seminar, I was watching Stargate Atlantis. And this guy, Ronan, he has a chip implant in his back that makes him be tracked down by life-sucking aliens wherever he goes. And wherever he goes, people around him will get killed because he gets tracked down by these life-sucking aliens and he will sometime always survive in some way because he's a badass, but everyone around him will die. This is not a very nice chip. Also, 7 of 9 here as a plot device, often uh, she's a Borg, so she's half human and half a cyborg and she can't live without her um, her synthetic parts, and she can't live without her human parts. So she's essentially a uh, merging of both. And she has a chip that they try to turn off that is a homing device. Uh, and as a plot device, it sometimes gets um, turned on. <coughs> so this is what I was thinking about when I saw the chip implant. Like, I don't want a tracker in my body. Of course I don't want that. Uh, and one of the first things that I realized is that this is not a tracker. And I already have a tracker in my pocket, and this is not 
Um, I can turn it off, but it's by design that this is a tracker. You know, the old dumb phones, they work by uh, tri cellular triangulation, and you can know within 100 meters uh, where someone is. And this is a feature. You can't have a uh, mobile phone working without that. Uh, and nowadays, with the smartphones, they have GPS. And this can, of course, be turned off with a software button. And I have noticed very many times how this is not, this is violated, that I have turned it off and it's still on. Uh, and with a GPS, we can know within a couple of meters where we are. And so, yeah, I used to turn the GPS off. Uh, all the time, and then I use this um, fitness tracker, and um, then I, I, I still always turn it off. And Tinder, it uh, forces me to use both Wi-Fi and GPS, although they triangulate me in a very, very bad manner. Uh, but they still force me to, to be very precise about where I am. And of course, Pokemon Go, it was a killer app for my privacy when it comes to GPS tracking. Uh, so nowadays, I think my GPS is always on. And I suspect it's the same with most of you. Uh, and in the future, and also now, we do have uh, cars with trackers in them. With the self-driving cars, they will obviously also be tracked. How many of you have wearable trackers? Okay, there are very few that admit to it. <laughs> so, when it comes to trackers, we are already being tracked all the time, and my chip is not a tracker. So let's go on to cyborgs. Uh, this guy, uh, he's a, a cybernetic organism, living tissue of our me metal endoskeleton. Uh, he's the complete, opposite of me in his essence, because he's really an artificial intelligence in an android body who also happens to have living tissue, but that living tissue is just ornament. He doesn't need it. He just needs it. It's just a plot device for getting through that time hole without being able to take any, any high-tech weapons with you. And uh, since we now are in uh, Ruhrpott, I needed to take craft bag with it, uh, with me here. Uh, the, man, the man, machine, superhuman being. So the original definition is a space age definition, 1960, a human being with bodily functions aided or controlled by technological devices. So here we have a pacemaker. It's implanted in the body. This is an insulin pump which is attached to the body but nevertheless, that person needs it in able to survive. Uh, this is an intrauteral device. This is uh, a schematics for uh, dialysis. And why is Malala here? She got shot in the head. And um, when she got shot in the head, she also lost hearing. And then they gave her this cochlear implant that uh, made her regain her hearing in some way. So we can have a, a cyborg definition of, of implants. So you also have the hip implant here and my chip implant. And Malala, the intrauteral device and the uh, uh, pacemaker is already uh, is, is with us all along. Uh, and of course, in Germany, there is a organization for cyborgs. Of course there is. It's Germany, you know. So a cyborg is a human being with an electronical device implanted in or steadily attached to the body with the purpose of increasing individual senses or abilities beyond the occasional use of tools. Given this definition, you all are already cyborgs because you 
always carry around your smartphone, which is, and you use it beyond the occasional use of tools. Um, it can also be used as a unique identifier in most cases. Uh, this has been kind of a slippery slope, but nowadays, uh, by this definition, you are all cyborgs. Uh, so a problem about cyborgism is that there are so many definitions. Uh, and uh, some of them might not always fit your, um, your purposes. But uh, one, of, one of the core functions is to regain or enhance bodily functions. And in the case of the cochlear implant, for example, uh, you use it to regain or gain a bodily function, but it can actually also be used to enhance a bodily function into superhuman he hearing. But this is, at the time, not considered ethical. So it's not been do done on purpose, at least. So we are at PasswordsCon. Uh, I hope that most of you know the difference here, but I'm going to go through it anyway, because of YouTube purposes, maybe, or because, yeah, it's always nice with a recap. Identification is, for example, my username. Authentication is my uh, username uh, combined with a password, for example. And after I've um, supplied this, I will get an access level, and that's my authorization. So authentication and authorization is not the same thing. Um, now I'm going to confess to a crime. <laughs> so when I was 17 years old, 17 years and 354 days. There was a punk concert that I really, really needed to go to. And uh, since it's Sweden, uh, they are very, very hard on uh, the age limits because of alcohol and such. Um, so I did the only right thing. I borrowed my sister's ID. And now it's a question for you guys. Which one of these Passport pictures is me, and which one is my sister? So how, who of you think it's this one? And how many of you think it's that one? And how many of you think it's a trick question? <laughs> okay, so they're both me. Uh, this will illustrate the problem about uh, identification as we have it right now because it can be side-channeled. Uh, so this is my un unique identifier, but it's not entirely unique. Uh, it's entirely possible to go through and go on the sides of it. And I suppose that in this case, they were only interested in authorizing that I was over 18. They were not actually interested in authenticating that I am exactly who I claim to be. But they... Um, and also, I think that not every uh, door guard wants me to be outside just because I'm 17. So they maybe don't really care about this. They only care about if they will get a fine. Uh, so this is identification and authentication today. Signatures, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't even know my, <laughs> my own signature. So. I suppose it can be very easily forged, even by myself. Uh, I, I don't understand how anyone will take my, my signature seriously, because it's always different. Uh, and this is, of course, what we already talked about, this authentication with, uh, with username and passport, password. And this is a passport. And this is a biometric passport with an RFID chip in it. Uh, also some basics. Authentication and identification basis is something you know, which is, for example, a username or passport, password. Something you have, which is a passport, or a software token, or a hardware token. Something you are, which is, for example, biometrics. Uh, my chip, I don't know if it's something I have because it's a hardware token, a chip implant, or it's something that I am because it's integrated into my body. So it's somewhere between that. 
So if we need, have the need for stronger, unique identification, what about biometrics? There are a number of problems with this, and I suppose that someone in here is so much more knowledgeable about this than I am. But some of the problems is the false negatives. I experience this all the time when I go to my gym. Mm -hmm. I take out my NFC card and I do my fingerprint and I say, no, you're not you. Like, I promise, this is my finger. I, the last time I checked, at least. But uh, <coughs> it's very prone to false negatives. It's not a secret and it's not changeable. So, um, this guy in Seattle called Emil Grafstra, he thought, I, I don't, I, I'm not sure that he was talk, you know, thinking about identification before, but maybe he was just thinking about, hey, this would be cool. Pets have implants. Why can't I have an implant? Uh, so he ordered a pet implant, and I think he tweaked it a bit, because these pet implants, uh, they are made to grow into the body because veterinaries are not very good piercers. But uh, when we do a chip implant like this, we want the piercer to be a good piercer. So it's uh, not growing into my body. Um, I'm going to go back here. Uh, the idea of the chip implant is to change the question of biometrics. Instead of teaching a machine to read a human, why don't we teach the human body to speak to the machine? So now I have something in, in my body that is talking in a machine code way. So bring forth the XNT implant. It's ISO 14443 compliant and thus uh, totally possible to uh, scan with a chameleon implant, a uh, chameleon um, card that we had a keynote about yesterday. It's less than one kilobyte of, uh, uh, of data memory and a seven byte unique identifier. It's 12 millimeters long. It's biocompatible glass so that uh, it can move around inside my body, but it, it won't move around inside my body, but it won't grow into my body. It's easily taken out, although it's, you know, you, you need to, to puncture the skin, but you can't take it out. Uh, this antenna is 1.5 millimeters long, and the specifications for the 14443 ISO states that the uh, antenna should be something like this. It's like, uh, it's made for passports and for credit cards and not for implants. So this antenna is very, very weak. Uh, one thing that we also have to realize about NFC technology is that it's passive. There is no battery in this. So I need a reader in a, to be able to activate it at all. There is no way to detect this without the proper reader. Obviously, you can, you can see it through my skin, but uh, you have to look very, very carefully. So this is a body modification. And for me, the step into doing this wasn't very hard because I have been doing piercings and tattoos before. Uh, the third kind here is the breast implant because I think the definition of a body modification is that uh, it's a body changing your body in a way for beauty or for psychological pleasure or for psychological need. Uh, and not for any medical purposes at all. So this is a kind of body modification. I would say it's a mixture between a piercing and a subdermal implant. My chip, I have a PGP fingerprint. I have my LinkedIn profile. And I can unlock my phone with a unique identifier. And since you saw what you saw yesterday, it's not a very good idea to use this as a lock because you can't keep this a secret. You can't um, keep this from being cloned and reused. So um, 
So I, I don't, uh, on a regular basis, use this to open my phone, but that's also because the antenna is so small and the reader in my phone is so bad that they don't match together and it takes like forever. <coughs> the fingerprint is so much more convenient. But I can do it if my NFC is on and I don't want to have my NFC on because I have my wallet here and then I do like this and the mobile goes like all the time. Um, so it's not very convenient. But the next generation is gonna be a cryptographic platform, Java card NFC platform. Um, it's called VivoKey and they work together with a Swedish startup called Fidesmo that does unified NFC uh, identification with cards. And they say that, hey, why not have the next generation to be an implant? I don't know. Um, so now I'm gonna change subject completely and go back to the year of 1759 when Sweden had the first records of every person in the whole country that was born, dead, or migrated. So we have been knowing for more than 250 years exactly who has been living here, who has been registered here um, legally. And uh, then came along the personal identity number, and since 30 years ago, these are now centralized. So these uh, personal identity numbers are used for everything. If you are in Sweden and you don't have one of these, you can't do much. You, you can't get a phone, you can't, like, there, there's a lot of things that you really cannot do without it. And uh, it's also been used for, for doing a lot more usable uh, identification over the internet. For example, on some, uh, some e-commerce sites, I can um, enter my email and then I can enter my uh, personal identity number and they will find my whole identity where I live and everything and then they say next, next and it's done. The bill goes to my email. This is really, really convenient and that's why it's used. And an extension of this is the bank ID. And the bank ID is a, in most cases, it's a hardware token that I carry inside my mobile phone. So we have seven million of these. There are 10 million inhabitants in Sweden, meaning that almost everyone in the target group has a bank ID. There are two million uh, authentications made with this every year now, out of which 130 million are not um, money-based. So they are towards authorities. For example, in this case, it's the uh, unemployment, <coughs> the employment service. And I'm I identifying against it, and so I can log in in a very nice two-factor way. So, we are already used to this. We're already used to having unique identification done over the internet. So now I want you to philosophize about what 13% might represent. In this case, this is actually a Norwegian survey. It's the only survey that has been done about chip implants. And the question is, if, <coughs> sorry, Given that it is safe, are you willing to do a chip implant? Can I have some water? <coughs> Sorry. I do have some here. Is the chip coming out? Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. I was just wondering whether the chip gets thirsty or does it have its own appetite? No, this is my, this is my um, organic body speaking. Okay. So I'll, <laughs> I'll try to go on here. So given that it's safe, will you be able to do that? Will you be willing to do the chip implant? And 13% of those respondents said yes. <laughs> I think my voice really sounds strange now. <coughs> uh, 
and this is the only survey that has been done about this. Um, Norwegian and Swedish society are quite similar, uh, and you also have the bank ID. So I, um, and I suppose you're also a very tech sensitive, like we are. Uh, trend sensitive, I mean. So I believe the prerequisites, yeah, just fill it up. <laughs> For a positive ID chip revolution is societal acceptance for unique identification over the internet, societal acceptance for body modifications, and open, secure, safe, transparent hardware and software. And in this case, this chip is not, uh, it's proprietary. I, like, do we really want proprietary parts in our body? I don't know. So here are some open questions, and I suppose, yeah, I can, I can leave them. And now it's up to you to give me 100 questions, I suppose. <laughs>